Welcome to our Holy Spirit series entitled, Led by the Spirit. Led by the Spirit. We have been studying about the Holy Spirit since August of last year, and one of the roles that we actually mention of the Holy Spirit is to lead us to Jesus. Jesus said that if, you, if I go away, I will send him unto you, and, he, and I will abide in you. The role of the Holy Spirit is to turn our eyes upon Jesus. Last week, we studied about the Holy Spirit in the last days. Folks, stop sending me texts. <laughs> this morning, I want to talk about the urgency of the Holy Spirit. And we mentioned that the urgency of the Holy Spirit has everything to do with the fact that as the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit knows when you're going to die. I'll say amen for you. Amen. He knows. He's, he's God. So today I want to discuss that urgency of the Holy Spirit under the title, The Holy Spirit and the Church. You know, sometimes, and we were actually taught in, in our master's program that for every five minutes that you pray, you need to be quiet for ten minutes. And the reason why is because prayer is a two-way communication. So I need to expect God to actually speak to me. And I do every day. I pray. And then I listen. I pray, and then I listen. And I do that for almost an hour and 15 minutes or so of my day, early in the morning. It's me and my dog talking to Jesus. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for what you have done so far. Now I ask you, Lord, that in an age where so much passes for religion that is just a sham and a pretense, where so much passes for religion that is false and counterfeit, we are so thankful for the promises of the Holy Spirit, that it is not something that we just need to wait on for the future, but it is a gift that is present right now for anyone who wants it. So I'm asking you, Father, that this worship service will be a changing worship service for each and every single one of us. And I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Some time ago, I read a story in a magazine about a woman that called up her insurance agent, and she said, I want to double my insurance uh, on my house right now. And the agent said, hey, I'm happy to actually help you with that, and, and, and I will be delighted to come over tomorrow and to increase your insurance in your house. She said, look, I cannot wait until tomorrow. It has to be done right now. I want to do it over the phone. I have my credit card. I'll give you my credit card number right now. I want to double my insurance in my house right now. And the agent said, listen, I'm going to come over tomorrow. But she said, you, she didn't pay any attention to him. And the man was getting a little bit irritated with her, and he said, listen, I, 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 I will take, I will come tomorrow night, and we cannot do it over the phone. There's a lot of paperwork that we have to sign. And the lady said, listen, you're not listening to me. You don't understand. My house is on fire right now, and I have to increase the insurance coverage right now. There are things that you have to do that cannot be put off. There are some things that you have to do, and you have to do it now. And one of those things is preparation for the coming of Jesus. I was actually praying to God. It's like, Lord, what do you want me to preach about next week? He's like, well, you know what? Preach to Tejon. I said, but How? Luther Warren, an early Seventh-day Adventist pioneer, said, the only way to be ready for the coming of Christ is to get ready today and to stay ready 
for the coming of Christ. And like we mentioned last week, we need to stay ready today. Don't think about tomorrow. Don't think about your past. Just think about today. What are you doing today? So just like we must ask for the Holy Spirit daily, we need to actually be ready for the coming of Jesus daily. And the way to be ready is to get ready and then stay ready. You see, there are some things that are urgent, but there are some things that you can actually, it doesn't make any difference whether you do it today, tomorrow, the next day. Jesus, in the book of Matthew, outlines the signs of his soon return. And one of those signs, and, and you know, we, we see all those signs happening all around us. But there are two key chapters of the second coming of Christ that are in the book of Matthew. Entire chapters devoted to the second coming of Christ. Matthew 24, we read about the signs of Christ coming that are happening around the world. But then you have Matthew 25 that, you, you know, we read about the preparation for Christ coming in the church. Two distinct chapters about the return of the Lord. The signs in the world and the preparation in the church. And as we go through Matthew chapter 24, we observe that, uh, you know, we assert that there will be wars and rumors of wars. There will be floods. There will be natural disasters. There will be crime everywhere. And as we look to those signs in the book of Matthew chapter 24, we see them being fulfilled all around us today. Lawlessness is abounding. There is famines. There is earthquakes, fires, floods. There is terrorism. And we stand at the edge of eternity. But Matthew chapter 24 concludes with a solemn appeal done by Christ. Go there with me, if you please. Go to Matthew chapter 24, if you have your Bibles, and go to verse 42. Matthew chapter 24, and this is what Jesus says in verse 42. Are you ready? Just one of you are ready? Are you ready? All right, let's read. It says, Watch therefore, for ye know not what the hour what hour your lord does come jesus says all these signs will be taking place all around you you can know his coming is near but we cannot know the hour is here we can know that it's near but we don't know the hour when it's going to happen so jesus shares with us the signs of his coming for us to be wise in preparing for it. But Jesus does not share with us the exact date of his return. You know why? Because guess who's going to put up the decision to follow Christ until that day? So Jesus says, what's therefore? Because you know not the what? Hour of his return. But then he makes his appeal in verse 44. Listen, he says, Therefore, be ye also ready, for in such, such hours as you think not, the Son of Man comes. So the appeal of Jesus is not that we have knowledge of when Christ will come, but rather that we are ready when he comes. So Jesus outlines the general signs of his return, but I get nervous when people begin to say, you know, I've been looking at a time chart, and I think all of these days, I got all these days figured out, and Jesus is going to come on this day, on this place. And friends, that was not the emphasis of Jesus in these verses. Jesus gives us the panoramic visions of signs. He paints the big picture. But when the appeal is made, the appeal is for our hearts, it, it, you know, it, it, it's saying, hey, be ye also ready. Matthew chapter 24 talks about the signs of Christ's coming. But Matthew chapter 25, we find three parables. And in these parables, each appeals to us to be ready. The parable of the ten virgins talks about our spiritual readiness. The parable of the ten talents talks about using our gifts that God has given to us. And we're going to talk about that in the next couple of Sabbaths. But then the parable of the ten talents talks about serving others in the context of readiness. And then we find the parables of the sheep and the goats, which talks about ministering to the needy and the poor. It talks about being compassionate in the context of readiness. 
Today, as we celebrate baptism, as we celebrate recommitment through a profession of faith, I want to take a look at the first parable, the parable of the ten virgins. And if you're a student of the Bible, you remember the story. If you're not a student of the Bible, it is a story that Jesus picks up from an ancient wedding. As Jesus was talking about the signs of the end, eh, 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 about, you know, Jesus then looked out and he saw an ancient wedding that was taking place. And he saw these ten bright maids that would light the way to the wedding. Now, in 14 of 21 parables listed in the book of Matthew, they refer to the kingdom of God. But you got to remember, Matthew was written to a Jewish audience. So he wrote about the church as to the kingdom of God. Now, it's kind of funny because in the Review on Herald, in August 19th of 1890, he says, I am often referred to the parable of the ten virgins, five of whom were wise and five foolish. This parable has been and will be fulfilled to the very letter. So here we find a comment on the parable of the ten virgins and that, that, that this parable will be fulfilled to the very letter. And if God directed someone's mind and brought it back again and again and again, wouldn't be, this be a parable that we want to study and understand? You see, Tejan and Sedona, as Tejan gets, gets baptized, I told him last night, this is not the end. This is just the beginning. And this is a vital parable for people preparing for the coming of Jesus. Do I have any of those here? If Jesus himself gave this parable as the first parable after Matthew chapter 24 describing the condition of the world just before the coming of Jesus and how to be ready for the coming of Christ, this must be an incredible and vital parable. So let's look at it. Matthew chapter 25, beginning in verse 1. It says this. Read it with me. It says, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto what? Ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Notice that this is a kingdom of heaven parable. And, and it is a parable that deals with the church. It says that the kingdom of heaven would be likened ten virgins. It refers to the kingdom of heaven as virgins. You know, remember, in the Bible, a woman represents the church. You see this in the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 12. You see the true church described as a woman dressed in white, pure, and with radiant garments. You also see it in chapter 17 of the book of Revelation. You see a harlot woman dressed in purple and scarlet. So in Revelation chapter 12, you see the bride of Christ, the true church. And in Revelation chapter 17, you see the harlot woman. So in Bible, in the Bible, excuse me, a woman represents the church. A woman represents what? A pure woman represents the true church. A harlot woman represents a fallen church or a church in apostasy. Now, there's something in the parable that is very fascinating. The Bible says that the kingdom of heaven will be likened to how many virgins? Ten. Now, numbers in the Bible are also important. Three represents the Trinity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. In Revelation, you see that you see the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. As we studied before, you also see the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, or the false trinity. All right? So three represents the Godhead. In the book of Revelation, seven represents perfection. Seven churches, seven seals, seven trumpets, the perfect working of God throughout history. In the book of Revelation, chapter 12, it indicates completeness. Then you have the number 12. You have, said you have the 12 tribes of Israel in the Old Testament. You also see the 12 disciples in the New Testament. It represents also the church as it actually stands up. In the book of Revelation, you have the number four representing universality. But what does the ten represent in the Bible? It's not easy, isn't it? In the days of Jesus Christ, there's something very fascinating that is happening here with the number ten. The number ten was the smallest number of Jewish men to comprise a synagogue. If a Jewish man 
was going to start a new synagogue, they would actually have to have at least 10 Jewish men to build it up. Now, why did Jesus use this number 10 in the parable? To let you and me know that what he was describing was the church, the synagogue of believers, his true church at the end of time. And, and there are pointers about it, the kingdom of heaven parable, the church, the 10 virgins, the church. Now, these 10 virgins or this group of believers, the church, has something in their hands. What is it? Come on, folks. What is it? Lambs. And in Scripture, in Psalm 119 and verse 105, it says, Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my Now, friends, I thank God that we don't have to guess at Bible symbolism. I thank God that he has made the symbols in Scripture abundantly clear. The kingdom of heaven, the church. Virgins, the church. Ten, the smallest number of Jewish men that comprises a synagogue. Lamps in their hands, the word of God. I don't know about you, but that's good news, is it not? Because here's a group of people, ten virgins, representing God's church. They have the word of God. These are Bible-believing, Sabbath-keeping, carrot juice-drinking, veggie links-eating, Adventist Christians. This group of people is not out there in apostasy. They're not in rebellion. They haven't turned their backs on, God, on God's word. This is his church. That means that all of them must be very wise, right? I mean, if they are all in the church, they must be very wise. If they are all virgins, they must be all ready for the coming of Jesus. They will be saved by his grace, living a prayer for life, obeying God. I mean, not one of these ten could be possibly could possibly be lost, could they? Let's see what Jesus says. The parable continues in verse 2. It says, and five of them were wise and five were foolish. And that leads me to a very important question that I asked Jesus this week. I said, why were, they, why were the wise wise, and why were the foolish foolish? I mean, they're all worshiping together. They're all part of, of you know, they, they were all part of believers. Why would they be wise? Why would the wise be wise, and why would the foolish be foolish? I think I know. You know, people always tell me, Mario, that's because the wise, the wise were always, you know, they were awake. And the foolish were asleep. What do you think? Is that what the Bible says? The Bible puts it this way. Watch me now. In verse 5, it says this. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumber and slept. Does that say that a few slept? Does it say that five of them slumber and slept? What does it say? All of them slumber and slept. So the wise weren't wise because they were awake. And the foolish were not foolish because they were asleep. You see, as time went on, and as the coming of the Lord was delayed, tarried, there was a spiritual lethargy that swept over both the wise and the foolish virgins. And that is my theme for this sermon today. I, I, and I want Tej and Sedona and everybody that, have, that is contemplating to be a, a member of the church. Friends, there is a danger that the Christian church faces today. Oh, no, no, no. Let's come closer. There is an incredible danger that the seven-day Adventist church faces today. The longer time goes on, the more one can declare with their lips that they believe Jesus is coming soon, but in their heart of hearts, they're asleep. Oh, let me say that one more time. The longer time goes on, the longer the delay takes place, the greater the possibility to enter into spiritual lethargy. I mean, isn't that what Jesus is talking about here? He is warning that the entire church, wise and foolish, not to fall into the deep sleep on the, on the edge of eternity. You know, it's like the message of the prophet Isaiah. 
in Isaiah chapter 60 and verse 1, listen to what it says. This is actually the being fulfilled right now. It speaks to this generation. It says, arise, shine. Do what? Shine. Arise and shine. Arise out of your sleep and shine. For the light is come and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth. Are we living in a time where darkness is covering the earth? The darkness of spiritualism, the darkness of Satanism, the darkness of demonism. We are living in a time when darkness is covering the earth. And Jesus is speaking to his entire church today and says, Arise and shine, for your light is Christ. That is our destiny. This is our time to share the light of Christ to the whole world. This is our time to be filled with the Holy Spirit and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall arise upon thee and his glory shall be seen upon thee. God is going to yet do something with his lumbering, sleeping church. God is yet going to do something, folks. God is going to move with his Holy Spirit. There will be a powerful spiritual revival in these last days of earth's history. And what's going to happen when the revival takes place? Verse 3. Read it with me. It says, and the Gentiles shall come. Who are the Gentiles? The heathen. They shall come to your light. <laughs> That's an amazing prophecy. The church will not flicker and go into it out in darkness. His people will not sleep forever. There will be a mighty Holy Spirit spiritual revival. Jesus' power will be moved through his church. Men and women will be on their knees seeking God. And the reason why more people do not come to be part of God's true church now is not because they don't have spiritual longings in their hearts. You know why it is? It's because they have not seen the light of Christ and the fullness of the Spirit in the lives of His people. I'm serious about this today, folks. I have preached all these sermons before just waiting for this one. God cannot do something with you until he has done something for you. God cannot do something through you until he does something to you. You cannot share what you have not experienced. The Gentiles, the heathen, will come to our light the light of Jesus Christ rising in his people. But we're not done. And the kings to the brightness of thy rising. You see, we have not seen yet what God is going to do. Look at verse 4. It says, lift up your eyes round about and see. Lift up your eyes, movement family, all around you and see. Jesus says to his sleeping church, lift up your eyes and see all around you. All they gather themselves together, they come to thee. The greatest revival in history is going to take place. The greatest soul winning initiative that this church in this world have never seen before is going to take place. Pentecost is nothing in comparison to what is going to happen. 3,000 baptized in a day. The early rain, according to Hosea, was moderate. I don't know about you, but if I saw 3,000 baptized in a day, I mean, I saw 99,000, but 3,000 baptized in a day, that's not moderate. No, 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 no. But, but, but it's only moderate in comparison to what's going to come. We have not yet seen what God is going to do because it is written in Revelation 18:1 that the whole earth will be lightened with the glory of God. It also written in Habakkuk uh, chapter 2 that, the, that the, the, the glory of God will go from one end of the earth to the other. Wouldn't it be a shame to sell your soul cheap when you are almost at the verge of the greatest outpouring of the Holy Spirit? You see, this is no time for lethargy. This is no time for spiritual drowsiness. This is not the time for literacy and complacency. This is no time to drop out of the church. 
This is the time to recognize that God is about ready to do something that is unusual with the church empowered by the Holy Spirit. The church filled with the oil of his grace. God's people will illuminate the, the, the world with his glory. Christ will come and return to this world. But the question still remains, why? Why are some spiritual, spiritually drowsy right at the verge of eternity? Why are some sleeping? Why do the wise virgins, what do the wise virgins have that the foolish lack? And how can you keep from being a foolish virgin? You see, these foolish virgins believe the same thing as the wise virgins. I want to put this in perspective. They were all together. They attended church together. They said amen together, hallelujah. They were all participating, or uh, excuse me, anticipating the coming of the bridegroom. They all have lamps in their hands. They believe in the same doctrine, the biblical doctrines. So what is the essential difference between the foolish and the wise virgins? Is it possible that I think I am wise, I'm a wise virgin, but in reality I'm a foolish virgin? I mean, is it possible that my perception or my spiritual experience is greater than it actually is? Let's study this passage together and see if we can discover the difference between the wise and the foolish virgins. Matthew chapter 25 and verse 3, this is what it says. It says, they that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. Now, it is not that the wise were awake and the foolish were asleep. It's not that at all. All slumbered and slept. They had this spiritual drowsiness. But there's something that the wise had that the foolish one did not have. What was it? Oil. Those who were foolish took their lamps but took no oil. They had some oil in the lamps before, didn't they? But they ran out of oil. I wonder what that means. You see, they had some oil, but the lamps burnt dimly. They did not replenish the supply of oil that they, that they had previously. You see, they forgot something that we've been studying for the past three weeks. It is the concept that you cannot make it to the end on the same tank of oil. Folks, you can, in Tejan, you cannot make it to the end with the Holy Spirit that God is going to give you today. You got to fill up, how often? Daily. Notice Matthew chapter 25, and look at verse 5. It says, What the bridegroom Terry they all slumber and slept. So, or, you know, tarry or delay. So there was a delay in the coming of Jesus. They all slumber. And at midnight, there was a cry, May, behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. This cry was given. Those, then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil. For our lambs are gone out. Now, friends, this is the key. Their lambs have not yet gone out. Their lambs, their lambs have not yet gone out. Don't miss that because I, I read this parable for years and I missed this point all along. Their lambs have not yet gone out. In other words, they still have a flickering of spiritual experience. They have not turned their backs on in apostasy, but their spiritual lamps are in the process of going out. Their spiritual experience is waning. Their prayer life is declining. Their Bible study is declining. They have an intellectual knowledge of the truth, but their hearts has not been transformed by the grace of God through his Holy Spirit. But the text goes on. And says in verse 9, 
But the wise answer, <laughs> saying, ah, uh -uh, not so. Let there be no, in, not enough for us and you. See, the wise and foolish virgins are together. One thing our parable teaches us is that whatever this oil is, you cannot get it from somebody else. You got that? A wife cannot get it from her husband. A husband cannot get it from his wife. Children cannot get it from their parents. You cannot get it from some preacher. You cannot get it from some TV program. You can only get this oil from Jesus. Folks, every human being must come to Jesus for an abundant supply of the oil of God's grace in the Holy Spirit. But then they said, go rather to them that sell it and buy it for yourself. And while they went out to buy, the bridegroom came. Here comes the seriousness. There is going to come a point that our destinies will be decided. That either we will have fully committed to Christ, being completely on Jesus' side, or by repeated choices, we're going to have, we will have anesthetized our brains spiritually to the point that we are locked in latency and complacency. And then it says, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. See, the door of probation will not shut by some arbitrary act of God. No, no, no. You know, there are those, those Christians that come to me, even some Seventh-day Adventists. I go preaching in, in, in a lot of places, you know. Oh, what, what if the door was already shut, Mario? What if I'm already lost? What if the door was being shut for me and my name has already come up in judgment? Is this some date on the calendar where God says, you know what, okay, I'm going to shut the door. If you're in, you're in. If you're out, you're out. No! The door is shut when every human being on planet Earth has made their final irrevocable decision. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. He that is holy, let him be holy still. The shut door in the sanctuary of heaven is an acknowledgement that if the door was open any longer, nobody else will make a decision. The shut door in the sanctuary in heaven is God's acknowledgement that everybody has sealed their destiny by the decisions they have made. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. He that is holy, let him be holy still. He that is unholy, let him be unholy still. Before the coming of Jesus, the events of this world will catapult everybody into making some decision for or against Christ. And let me tell you something, folks. Not even myself can take you to heaven. I'm a sinner. And that, that makes me wonder, why do people are so bent out of shape about people? Oh, so-and-so said, can so-and-so take you to heaven? And the decision that we are making right now settles and determines our e eternal destiny. Did you get that? The decision we make every single day form grooves of character in our brains. Have you ever seen a sidewalk that goes like this, and then like this, and then like this, and then like this? Some people don't want to actually get the extra exercise, walking down the sidewalk, you know, like this, and like this, and like this. No, no, no. Well, you know what they do? They, 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 they walk down the sidewalk, and they cut across the grass. Have you ever seen one of those? In the military, they used to see, you know, do that. Oh, do push-ups until I get tired. One person cuts across the grass, and somebody else will see their footprints, and they say, you know what, I think I'm going to go this way too. And somebody else sees their footprints, and they say, you know what, I'm going to go this way too. 
And after you do that long enough, what happens to the grass? You got a path, right, on the grass. Well, in the neurons of your brain, every little decision you make to compromise truth creates a path in your brain. Every decision you make not to pray when you get up in the morning, to rush out to work, to not feast on God's word, creates a pathway of lethargy in your brain. So you may be in the church, you may believe the truth, but sometimes, a, but, but, but something happened in your spiritual life. My soul had become barren. My spiritual life has become empty. The oil of the spirit is gone. And that's the story of the foolish virgins. They intellectually believed the truth. They associated with the wise virgins, but something in their heart is gone. Because the pathway that they have, that they have worn in their brain by conscious decisions that they have made is one of spiritual complacency. Afterwards came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. And this is the key verse in the whole parable. I do not what? Know you. See, I've been telling you about this. There's one thing about knowing about Christ. There's another thing about knowing Christ. And you know what the word know in the Bible is the, the intimate relationship that a husband has with a wife and a wife has with her husband. There was no intimacy with Jesus. They had an intellectual knowledge, but their hearts were cold. So Jesus says, watch therefore. For ye know not neither the day nor the hour where the Son of Man comes. Watch and pray. Watch and study the Word. Watch lest your spiritual life be robbed by the cares of this life. Watch lest the devil come and snatch away the deep interest for Jesus and the things of God. You see, the foolish virgins lack the call, the, 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 the all essential oil of the Holy Spirit filling their lives and transforming their hearts. Why does Jesus then use the symbolism of oil in the parable? What does the symbol of oil represent in Scripture? And why does Jesus use this symbol? You know, if I ask the average Christian in the audience or even a Seventh-day Adventist, what does, they, what does Jesus, you know, use? Why did Jesus use the oil? What does the oil represent? What is the typical answer? The Holy Spirit. But I want to ask a deeper question. The oil represents the Holy Spirit. In that answer, you were right. But my question is this. Is fire also a symbol of the Holy Spirit? Is water a symbol of the Holy Spirit? Why doesn't God use fire in this parable? Or why doesn't he use water? Why does he use or chooses oil? You can only understand the impact of using oil in this parable to understand a, 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 until you understand the threefold meaning of oil in the Old and New Testament. So let's look at it. Number one, throughout the Old Testament, Oil symbolizes total, complete consecration. Total and what? Come on, total and what? When the prophet comes to anoint David as a king, he sets him apart and anoints him by oil. When the elements of the sanctuary were set apart, they were consecrated with oil. When the high priest was set apart, oil is placed upon his head. Oil is placed upon his eyes. Oil is placed down his face. Oil is placed in his hands. Oil is placed in his, foot, in his feet. Oil was placed in his head, symbolizing that his brain is consecrated to Jesus. Oil is placed in his eyes, symbolizing that the, the, he only shall look at that which is anointed and holy. 
oil is placed in his mouth so that he can only speak that which is holy. Oil is placed in his hand so that his hands will reach out in ministry of holiness. Oil is placed in his feet for he shall go in the pathways of holiness. Oil symbolizes consecration. That is the, that, that, that this article, this individual, this, this, it, it, this individual is completely consecrated to Jesus Christ. So the foolish virgins vacillated while the wise virgins have pri one priority in mind. Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness. They were totally consecrated to Jesus Christ. But now there's a second meaning of oil in the Bible. Oil represented healing. You remember in the New Testament when the Good Samaritan met the man on the way, on the, uh, by, by the wayside? What did he do? He poured out oil and wine. That was a symbol of the grace of Jesus Christ. Oil was a symbol of the healing balm of Jesus. Uh, grace forgives us, but Jesus' grace heals us. Oil is a symbol that the Holy Spirit has entered my life and healed me from the inside out. That I am, a, I am healed of anger. I am healed of bitterness. I am healed of resentment. I am healed of lust. I am healed of gossip. When you come to Jesus and you consecrate your mind to him and you open your heart to him, and have an intimate experience with him, his grace flows into your life. You are consecrated to him. The healing balm of the Holy Spirit. The oil of the Holy Spirit enters into your life and does a deep work of healing. But there's another, one more aspect. Oil is a symbol of illumination. The candles in the sanctuary were illuminated by oil. So oil is a symbol of illumination or oil is a symbol of witnessing. Because God longs to have a people that are filled with his Holy Spirit and, have, and he longs for a people that are totally consecrated to him. He wants a people whom the oil has touched their head, their eyes, their ears, their mouth. The oil has set them apart. Jesus longs for a people who are totally sold out for him. The foolish virgins depended on the oil that they had acquired in the past. But they did not have a present experience with Jesus. That's why you need to get oil daily. I, I've been telling you about this. You cannot store oil for another day. Matthew 25 and verse, verse 6 then says, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go out ye to meet him. Friends, you cannot get an experience when, G, when Jesus comes that you don't have right now. You cannot get an experience then that you don't have right now. You cannot get an experience in the future um, hoping or grasping for it. Jesus invites us to know him for today. Why? Because we don't want to say like the foolish virgins in verse 8, our lamps are gone out. You know, we're counsel in Gospel Workers, page 274. We need an experience much higher, deeper, broader than many have yet thought of having. You see, today I'm not calling you to the superficial. I'm not calling you to some kiddie pool where, you know, with, with water up to your ankles to get a few pennies. I'm calling you this morning to something deeper and broader. Something that is higher than you could ever imagine. I'm calling you to die for pearls. To open God's word. To let God speak to you through his word. To let the Holy Spirit transform your life and to be consecrated by the oil. To be healed by the oil and let the oil fill your life. To illuminate you. To witness with a powerful way for Jesus Christ. 
You know what Jesus asked me this week? Does your heart still burn within you when you open the word of God? Does it? Do you still sense his presence when you get on your knees to seek him to pray? Do you sense the, 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 the presence of God closing you in? Do you? The wise virgins do. Do you still love to take those long walks along with Jesus and just pour out your soul to him? The wise virgins have one priority in their life. And that was to know Jesus and to be filled with the Holy Spirit. To be totally consecrated to him. To be healed within, the, within by the grace of, and the power of the Spirit. To the, that they long to have that intimate knowledge of Jesus. And like I told you last week, in the book that Reggie is using for his series, Christ Object Lessons, which by the way is probably the best commentary ever written about the parables. In Christ Object Lessons, Page 411 describes these foolish virgins like this. The class represented by the foolish virgins are not hypocrites. They have a regard to the truth. Were the foolish virgins hypocrites? No. Do they have a regard for the truth? Yes. They have a regard for the truth. They have, they have advocated for the truth. They are attracted to those who believe in the truth, but they have not yielded themselves to the Holy Spirit's working. They have not fallen upon the rock Christ Jesus and permitted their own nature to be broken up. Have you prayed that prayer? Jesus breaks me up. Break me up. And then it says, the spirit works upon a man's heart according to his desire and consent in planting in him a new nature. But the class represented by the foolish virgins have been content with a superficial work. They do not know God. But what is the difference between the wise and the foolish virgins? The foolish virgins are content with something superficial. They do not know God. But he continues to say, they have not studied his character. They have not held communion with him. Therefore, they do not know how to trust, how to look and live. Their service to God degenerates into a form. Notice the wise and foolish virgins are together in the church. They're hanging out. They're together doing service. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Amen, brother. One class does service with their hearts burning within them because they have an intimate relationship with Jesus and he, his love flows through, you know, through them. The other class still does service, but their service degenerates into a form because they have a superficial religion. They're still in the church, but it is a formal religion that they have. And in Ezekiel, it says it clearly. In Ezekiel 33 and verse 31, it talks about ancient Jews. It says, and they come unto thee as the people cometh, and they sit before thy people, and they hear thy words, but they will not do them. For with their mouth they show much love, but their hearts goes after their covetousness. So in the ancient Judaism, their experience is repeated in God's last day church. In ancient Judaism, their mouth went after God, but their hearts drifted from him. You remember what Timothy said about the last days, right? In 2 Timothy 3 and verse 1, it says, the, This know also that in the last days perilous times will come. In what days? Come on, talk to me. In what days? Are we living in the last days? Have perilous times come in the last days? Perilous times shall come. And then he says, For men shall be lovers of 
their own selves, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. These are the foolish virgins. They pontificate with their lips, but their hearts are far from God. These are the foolish virgins. They have a form of godliness. Jesus, please break my heart. I don't want any form of godliness. I don't want some superficial religious experience. I don't want to be playing church. And that's what I pray for every single day when I pray for Tejan, when I pray for Daryl, when I pray for Kathleen, when I pray for, you know, for every single one of you. And the question is, is that the desire you have this morning? To say, oh God, break my heart. God, give me a knowledge of Jesus that is so deep and so full that I revere your love to the people I am, I, I, that are around me. And that the light of your voice shines to the people around me. And that the power of your spirit works through me. Lord, let me be a light because the oil of the Spirit is filling my soul to illuminate the world in darkness and prepare it for the soon return of Jesus Christ. You see, there's a difference between having the word in your hand to defend the truth and having the word in your heart to live by the truth. And to love the truth. See, there's a difference between intellectual, cognitive knowledge in the head and a knowledge that gets into your soul, so passionately loving Christ. Has the truth which you believe and the Christ that you proclaim so, others, you, you, to, to, to others radically transformed your life? Are you a wise virgin or is your experience superficial? Do you remember the times that you used to pray? Do you remember the times when you used to study the Bible? You had that passionate love for Jesus, but things have changed and you're kind of just going through the motions now? I want to show you one more reference. You know, I read to you this, this, um, this verse before. He says, demons also believe and they tremble. Listen to this. Signs of the Time, February 17th, 1890. In the parable of the ten virgins, five of them are described as wise and five as foolish. The foolish virgins took, their, took no oil in their vessels with their lambs. They did not obtain the grace of Christ. They were just like the wise virgins as far as theory. As far as what? As far as what? And appearances were concerned. They had their lambs, but they had no oil. They made a profession, but they did not know what genuine conversion meant. And you're like, well, what is genuine conversion? It shows something like this. Genuine faith works by love and purifies the soul. There is a faith that has power to cleanse the life from sin. The devils believe that Christ came to this world as man's redeemer, that he wrought mighty miracles, that he was the one with the Father, that he died a shameful death to save fallen men. The devils actually believe that. Remember, demons do more than some of us do. They believe and tremble. We believe and keep going. What else do these devils believe? The devils believe that Jesus rose from the dead and that he ascended into heavens and that he sits at the right hand of the Father. The devils believe Jesus is coming again and that surely with power and great glory, taking vengeance on them that know not God and obey not the gospel. The devils believe that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. 
They believe that he died on the cross. They believe that he's coming again. They believe that he's coming shortly. They believe all of this recorded in the Old and New Testament. But will this faith save demons of darkness? They have not the faith that works by love and purifies the soul. That faith and that alone which cleanses the soul temple is genuine faith. Genuine faith reaches up and not only believes but accepts. It accepts Jesus' grace. It accepts his power. It accepts the promise of the Spirit. A genuine faith says all the promises in the book are mine. Every chapter, every verse, every word is mine. Genuine faith takes what God has says and internalizes it. Genuine faith takes what God has said and believes it. Genuine faith says, Jesus, you are not only the Savior, but you are my Savior. You not only forgive sins, but you forgive my sins. You not only give strength. You not only open the eyes of the blind and they are open and the, the ears of the deaf and they are, they are on stop. And, you, and the withered hand, and they, and they move, but by your touch, you touch my withered soul, and it was healed. You touch my blind eyes, and they can see. You touch my deaf ears, and they, I hear divine things now. My eyes were open, and I see divine things. You touch my palsy body, and my palsy soul, and bitterness, and anger, and resentment were gone. These white virgins had a living experience with the living Christ. The foolish virgins hope to make it up for their lack by associating with wise virgins. But you cannot do that. The foolish said, give us of your oil. The wise said, go to the one that sells them and buy them for yourself. The oil represents the sanctifying grace of the Holy Spirit. Sanctifying grace of the Holy Spirit. And let me tell you something, folks. Supply of oil from heaven never runs out. It never runs out. Never. All you got to do is ask every day. The story is told about these ten virgins who were waiting for the coming of the bridegroom. And it's there for a reason. And as I was actually asking God for this appeal today, I was preaching in one of the universities, Adventist universities around the world. And I preached on this parable of the ten virgins about the urgency of making a decision. And a young woman came up to me and said, I am one of those foolish virgins. I was brought up in an Adventist home but my experience with God is superficial now. I am a university student and I have so much to do in my studies that I don't pray anymore. I don't study the Bible anymore. Can you help me, Mario? So we sat down together and we opened God's word and I shared with her how to know Jesus. How to have a meaningful prayer life. How to open the Bible on her knees and, and pray through the Psalms. How to pray through the epistles of Paul. How to pray through the gospels. And that lady who, who would be rebaptized just a few days later wrote these words inside her Bible. I once was a foolish virgin, but tonight I am living here a wise virgin. Last year, or this year, I was preaching in this camp. It's called the Youth and the Final Crisis. 200 young people there. I was preaching, and, and, and I, I kind of, you know, the, I see this lady coming down the aisle, and I kind of recognize her, but I, don't, I didn't know who she was. She said, do you remember me? And I said, I'm sorry, I don't. 
She said, I am the sister of the girl that you saw three years ago. You know what happened to her? And I said, no, what happened? This girl, my sister, that you saw three years ago, she went back to school, and when she came home for Thanksgiving, she got into a terrible car accident, and she died on the scene. And when we went to get her Bible, written inside that Bible, it used to say, I was a foolish virgin, but I am now a wise virgin. And that little sister said to me, this is no time to fool around, Pastor. We are one heartbeat away from eternity. And I said to her, thank you. Thank you for sharing your story. She said, no, thank you for allowing to be used by the Holy Spirit. God longs to give you the deepest most intimate experience with him that you can imagine. Don't miss what God wants to do for you. Stumbling around in latency and complacency when you can have a vibrant experience filled with his grace. Why not make the decision right now to say, Lord, I want to have an intimate relationship with you from this point forward. So I'm going to pray. We're going to go through the tithe and offerings. You're going to go through the closing hymn. And then I want to meet you outside. So Tejan and I can do what we have to do. But as you go through this tithe and offerings and everything else, think about what God has been asking you to do for the longest time. We are one heartbeat away from eternity. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, I asked you a long time ago to this rough military man that you give me a heart of flesh, that you break my heart, that you give me compassion for those who are in need of Christ. But Lord, there are people here who have that need that I used to have. Lord, I fill up daily, not because of me. I do it because I love you. And Lord, everyone here is loved by you the same way that you love me. So Father, give us an experience. Give us an experience, a deeper relationship, intimate relationship with Jesus today. Today. So Father, as we go through this baptism maybe it is me who needs to be baptized next maybe it is me who need to recommit my life again maybe it is me who have been you have been calling for the longest time so father please touch our hearts touch our minds allow us to be guided by your spirit and we ask all this in jesus name amen